like, oh my God, this is so unexpected. Um, please sit down, sit down. Thank you, thank you. Oh my God, thank you. I hate fucking approval. Um, this is what happens when you give Lebanese ants crack. Um, <laughs> that was the most bizarre story, Mark. This is like a big Lebanese ant nest um, full of shams. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for that huge round of just spontaneously unsolicited <laughs> improvised uh, uh, love. Um, thank you. Uh, so thanks for having me here. I, um, yeah, I've changed some things. I've been away and, and um, I've been learning. Uh, this is what I've been doing. Uh, um, I like to think of it as evolving, but that's a wrong, that's the wrong word because evolution is not what everyone thinks it is. Uh, we talk about evolution as being this beautiful kind of poetic thing. It's not, it's a fucking brutal process where if you're weak, you die. Um, it's a boxing match. And also, um, there's this misconception that evolution has an intelligence. It doesn't. It's just if you put a bunch of shit in one place that's autonomous, eventually the one that's got the biggest strategy to win will win. It doesn't mean you're clever. You could just be brutal and you'll win. So, so it's difficult to say evolution. Um, th that's a misconception. Um, so this particular talk tonight um, was triggered by a couple of things. Um, the, f the first one is, um, in South Africa, we, ha we have terrible tendencies to have opinions and, and nothing else. Um, that's a huge problem. Like, I'm not, I'm not a, I think things are fucked, don't get me wrong. Um, but like, now that I've thought about it a lot and analyzed it, like, it really is fucked. But, but, but we'll argue about it in a Woolies queue, <laughs> y you know. Um, we'll say stupid shit like, I've done my research. You don't know what that means. Like, you can't just read a website and then you've researched, you know, like about a, like a, like a virus that you don't understand virology. You know? Most GPs don't understand COVID, and they're a doctor. Like, they've actually finger-banged dead bodies for, for <laughs> forever, and they still don't understand it, right? You haven't. So, so we, we have this tendency to kind of become, you know, we, we think about things like we have rights, you know, our opinion has, has a place in the world. It doesn't. <laughs> like, that's nonsense. If you find out about sort of social contracts, um, you don't really have freedom of speech. It's not absolute. You can't say whatever you want, because we're a group. And to get into this group, because you, you don't have to be in this group. You could be outside without, you know, medical care and some semblance of law enforcement. Um, I mean, I'm not suggesting it's perfect, but, you know, we have sort of shit we put together, more or less, all over the world. And in order to get into that, you've got to agree to certain things. So you can say some things you like, but there are things that even if you want to say them, you can't say them because they harm the group. So, so, you know, when you say I've got freedom of speech, yes, within bounds. You know, when you've got the right to do things as an individual, yes, within bounds. So, so I've been trying to understand that better. And as a result of that, I don't think I'll do comedy again. Because comedy in South Africa seems to be a poison that's not making things better. I mean, it'll make you laugh. I just came in and was racist about Lebanese people. I equated them to ants. Um, the UN says that when you start comparing people to animals, it's a precursor to genocide. <laughs> Hilarious. And so... <laughs> <laughs> now I've got to kill your whole family, Mark, with a panga. And so I started noticing things that, you know, I watch other, myself do it as well. You know, um, people walk on stage, you know, the idea of just being colored is hilarious. Walking on stage and going, I wear, and then people start laughing. What you're really saying is that your race is a joke. I don't think that's helping. <laughs> Thank you, one black guy in this entire place. <laughs> you don't understand how much I need your approval right now. <laughs> you are legitimizing me. Thanks for wearing a hat. It's him. So, so, so that's the first lot of stuff, right? We, we don't really know what we think we know. That, that's really important, and so we'll talk about that. But secondly, there are two incidents that happened recently, and, and that's why this talk came about, because the thing that I've learned most getting older is, is that I would like to admit my own mistakes first. Like, that's the first part of a real learning journey. It's not pointing at the other person and saying, fuck you, your argument's wrong because of this. Like, I find that so bad, and that's what we do. We do it with politicians, they do it to each other, we do it to each other. We're not gonna fix anything. The best way to go is, hey, I'm fucked. Like, that's quite good. So I wanna talk about how, oh, 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 these are all the things you can do to tell everyone that you were here, because if you don't tell them, we were never here. So that's really important. Um, 
But I was really lucky because I was born winning the lotto every morning. I'm kind of a heteronormative, like a straight white male in South Africa. Like that is the easiest job you can have, okay? But it turns out that it's global as well. I can go anywhere and there are ones just like me and I'm part of a club. It's happened in a, in a, in a, in a cab in London when the, when the driver in the cab, also white male, heard that I was South African. He just opened this racist fucking, like, like, like I don't know, like floodgate that he'd been waiting to get one of me in his cab as if I was in his little gang. And then you know the blah, blah, and I was like, just stop the fucking cab. Like, I, I hate you. I'm wearing nail polish. I'm not built for this. And so, and so, <laughs> so someone very clever asked me to watch the Dave Chappelle comedy show, um, The Closer, the, the, the last special. And I actually was a Dave Chappelle fan until I saw The Closer. But we watched it through a very particular lens. I didn't watch it as a comic. I didn't deconstruct his material as a, as a comedian. I didn't watch it as a fan. I used to think he was quite a good satirist. He was a social commentator, much like the work that I aspire to. I thought it would be a good to work. But we watched it through a whole different lens. I watched him as a man, uh, talking about other groups of people. And I realized that I've just been talking about white males and now I'm discussing a black male. Well, the weird thing is, as you acquire power and money in the world and fame, uh, you become more like a white male. So I think that Dave Chappelle is dangerously close to becoming a fully-fledged white male. <laughs> and I'll explain why. Around the same time, another great South African icon of social commentary, Gareth Cliff. <laughs> Jesus, read something, Gareth. Um, um, <laughs> well, we've got this problem. You see, we've got this huge problem. I call it 702 syndrome. <laughs> if a white person talks on 702 enough, about something, they become an expert. They don't need a degree, they don't need any research. As long as they said it on 702, bingo. God bless Bruce Whitfield, bless him. He's a wonderful, sweet man, I love him. Never run a business. Every day we tune in at, at seven o'clock and he tells us the market has either gone up or down. Fucking genius. <laughs> Every night, you can, he, like clockwork, it's up. <gasps> Tomorrow, it's down, fuck, where did that come from? How could that possibly happen in a free market system? So, so it's a problem, um, but somehow, with our bullshit, we are crushing it, it's really working. And there are a couple of reasons. So this guy's called Umberto Eco, he's an Italian, he's a very, very intellectual guy, he's very clever, he's written lots of books and he's fucking learned a lot, right? So he said this recently and he got into trouble because he basically said that social media is where idiots reign supreme. But he makes a very important, he was attacked for saying this. But the thing that I liked about what he said was, he, he said those words in gray without harming the community. And, and this is the point of where it starts to become really important. You don't have to like someone if they're rude about Twitter. But the problem is we now allow idiots to gang up on the community and do real damage. When things are canceled, I get that there's been a huge amount of social good done by activists using Twitter. There have been some good things, but how much damage have we seen? And what's the impact on the people around that villain that we identify? And what's the difference between a mob in the street killing someone and, and canceling someone on social media and the damage on the people who did nothing, the family, the workers, the other people around that person? So he basically said that we used to limit this idiocy to dinner parties. Now, there's no limit to it. There's huge responsibility with the technology we now have to connect. And we don't really do much about that because when those fuckers do, do damage, they just quietly slink away afterwards. We don't hold them to account. You know, you want the people who caused the riots in KZN to get caught and to see some kind of justice. Well, what about everyone else? So, so I think he's right. We have to respect like the people who do the work. It's quite important. We need those minds who've actually done the work and aren't just standing in a Woolworths queue. You know, this country's fucked. Okay, why? Give us references, you dick. <laughs> so tonight, I hope what I'm gonna do is give you some references for kind of why I have the thoughts that I do because that's my new work. I won't say anything unless I know that I've checked it out. And if I think it's wrong, I'll even say it might be wrong because I think if we're more responsible, and the truth is sitting here in this room, having access to this technology the way you have, kind of puts you in the same space as me. We're in this kind of top percentile. 
So you kind of share that responsibility too. Don't be the mob in the Woolies queue. Like, do you really know that kale does what they say it's gonna do? I'm using a harmless example because I want to start slow. Um, so here's a good example of how people cherry pick important things. So everyone tells me when I was growing up that Karl Marx once said that religion is the opiate of the masses or the opium of the people, and that's where they stop, okay, because that's the simple one. And if you kind of don't like religion, well, well, that kind of has a meaning. It's like religion is a drug, and then you use it to addict people, and then you enslave them. Like, that's what, that's what an opiate does. But it's not really, because opium wasn't actually meant to do that. It was supposed to kill pain. What he really said was this. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of soulless conditions. It's the opium of the people. It's one of the most beautiful things ever said about religion. It provides comfort. It kills the pain of this ape living on a rock, knowing that no matter what the fuck you do, you are gonna die. Everything you know is gonna die. Everyone you love is gonna die. A lot of them before you. So get yourself some fucking opium. It took an atheist from a distance to witness the beauty, the profound usefulness of that framework. Not a lot of atheist suicide bombers. You very seldom hear in a crowded market, nothing who Akbar. <laughs> but we took this great work, we took this profound idea, and we reduced it down to, you guys are just junkies. Of course there's hatred. I'm an atheist, I have like religious friends. I love the fact, I love the fact that I have religious friends. I get the benefit of their bullshit. My friends will treat me better because they wanna to go to heaven. They'll treat me better here. Why the fuck would I not like invest in that system? I can murder the fuck out of whoever I want. I can have my dick in the dead body. They still need to treat me well. Why would I undermine that idea? It's brilliant, okay? So, so the problem is that the Kool-Aid is poison. But another profound point came up about this, and also, smart person. Sometimes you need distance from something to understand its true beauty. You don't need to be in the thing. And I don't know if we do that enough. I don't know if we look at each other's stuff from a distance and go, fuck it, there are so many things about that, that's amazing. Let me ask you, if we decided to live here because the tryst is amazing and we don't know if they're really that busy. Now, <laughs> let's say we were gonna live here and we needed some rules to get ourselves a bit of a community going. If I said to you, here's some basics. If I said we will never harm children, would you, would you like that? Put your hand up if you would go with that rule. Okay, the majority, it carries. Let's say we would never kill an animal unless it was trying to kill us or we wanted to eat it. Would you, would you say that's a good rule? Mm, no, that was a bit shit. Hang on, that wasn't quite didn't carry. Seriously, if it, won't, if it wants to attack you, would you not kill it? And if you wanted to eat it, would you not kill it? Okay, I don't eat animals, but you might want to, so I would be okay with that. If you wanted to eat the animal, I don't have to eat it. That's fine. Is that good? If I said to you, I will never take your stuff unless you offer it to me, would that be okay? Why would no one put their hand up for that? Like, who are you people? Seriously. <laughs> Like a burglar arrives in your house and you say no, and they go, okay, fair enough, we had a rule, we had a rule. If I said to you there was a rule that you couldn't complain about something if you could fix it, wouldn't that be a good rule? Can we agree that those things I've just said are not bad rules for the basis, I'm not saying those are all the rules, but that's pretty good. So if you think on average those are good rules, put your hands up. Okay, most of us in this room agree with the first founding laws of the Church of Satan in California. Well done. I'm proud of you. Because you didn't worry about where, the, where they came from, you just resonated with the fact that those were good rules. Of course you didn't. You shat yourselves when you heard where it came from. Because that's how you've been programmed. I'm not part of the Church of Satan. I, I, I don't have to be, I got divorced. Now, now, now. <laughs> Such a bad joke. <laughs> that joke is exactly why I don't do comedy anymore. And the fact that you laughed makes it partially your fault. Now, now. Sometimes we need the distance. We mustn't be attached to everything. And if we, if we aren't attached, we can see beauty where we may not have seen it if we were close up because we're part of the spell. If you leave the system, you leave the spell, which means you can see the beauty. 
can see the benefit. And we don't do that enough. And that's the beauty of diversity. True diversity doesn't mean you get other people who don't look like you to do what you want them to do. That's not diversity. Diversity is you truly exist over there and I watch it and I like it without an agenda. That's diversity. The Kool-Aid is poison and it really is anyway. So, so we like to have bun fights and we should, but we need to improve the quality of our bun fights. We really need to fight more, argue more. We, we need to get really fucking serious about bun fights. We've gotta be more robust. We have to engage each other better. We mustn't be polite all the time. Diplomacy is a fuck up because it just makes us kind of like agree, but we don't really. Because if you don't fight enough, you end up with consumer excess and comfort, and then this shit starts to happen. These are real pictures from America. That actually a man who is so obese, he's riding a trolley, a cart, to buy more carbs, to make him bigger, to need more of a trolley, and his total statement to the world on his back, which is ironic, I hate queers. <laughs> because you know that's where queers approach from. Now, <laughs> who knew they could read? So, so, unadulterated hatred. I wanted to just show you this because I couldn't believe this myself, but I don't know if you can see it from there, but this man is actually wearing a shirt that says, Black Rifles Matter. <laughs> like, you've actually got to calculate hatred to get to that point. Like, how dumb is this fucking guy and he's armed? So, so, uh, it's a white guy. White it's a white rifle. Well, there we go. So, so even more. I didn't even get to that point, but thank you. Thank you for that. Is it because the guy in the black hat sitting behind you? <laughs> what, what, what I'm trying to get at is that this is what happens when you just let shit go. This is a country where shit has just been let go. Like, it's just about consumerism. That's all it is. We can't, get, we can't let this happen. We've got to call each other out. We have to start being a bit more rigorous and applying brands. It's really important. We all have them. So, so I always use this example. Whenever I, who's been on the, on the you know, who's caught a plan? Okay, so, so if you caught the bus to the plan, cool. So you get on the bus and what's the first thing that you do? You fucking elbow everybody out the way to find one of those plastic coat hanger things to grab onto. It's like, if you don't, you are fucked. It's gonna end because you know what happens when they switch the bus on. They just machine gun anyone who doesn't have a fucking handhold. So you watch the behavior. People are frantically grabbing that thing, and then the moment the bus lurches forward, everyone goes like that. And there's a simple reason for that. It's biological. Once you grab a reference point, the rest of your body switches off. You are now slave to that reference point. That's it, you, you, you don't have anything. What you really have, though, when you are born is a set of gyroscopes. You've got this incredible balance system and it's an antagonistic muscle system. All these levers, and they understand. That's why you have hips, so you can actually shift your weight. You've got a core, you've got these like amazing fucking joints that can actually adapt. I don't use that thing, because I like skateboarding. So I ride the bus like a big skateboard. I just, I just watch what's going on, and then I kind of go like this, and then I ride the, to the plane. And I get dirty looks from everyone, because they're like, fuck this guy, he's a danger. <laughs> he's not doing what we did. No, I'm not, fuck you, I don't need to. Never harmed anyone. <laughs> and then wear nail polish, because then they're really not sure whether to confront you. Because they look at me and they go, I don't know if he's gonna rape me or write me a song. And, and <laughs> there's a distinction, there's a distinction between the kinds of stress that I cause on that bus and the stress I might cause. And they, these clever people, you can go and read this article, there are two kinds of stress. One is called distress, and that's not good. That's bad stress, it's bad for you. But what we never talk about is that there's a thing called eustress, which is excellent for you. It's what keeps you vital. It's the thing that made primal man so successful, constantly under this kind of like stress. Some of it was very bad, but the stress that kept him thinking and moving and adapting was excellent. But we've started to combine those two into one thing, and we avoid this thing called stress. It's unintelligent, because then you end up on a trolley in a Walmart saying that you hate queers. That's someone who's not having enough eustress. You need to subject the community to eustress. It's so important. And what I've done in the last couple of years is subject myself to that. Leaving comedy was an incredible stress. I still remember the night that I said my last joke, 
and then left the stage in Cape Town. It was fucking hot. It was heartbreaking. I nearly relapsed, not that night, but in the kind of ensuing heartbreak. I nearly started drinking and taking drugs again because it was too much. It was just this incredible separation. But it turns out that it was actually you stressful because it pushed me to something better. So don't avoid stress. Don't avoid that kind of thinking at the bry that you just wanna make everything polite. You wanna make everything just you know, cool and roll on again. Because what you're doing is just polyfillering over bad ideas. Subject yourself to you stress all the time. It's really good for you, and you can read that article. It'll actually explain how you can live longer and better if you subject yourself to stress. There's no shortage of stress. We live in an unprecedented age of distress. We really do, and it's all about something called cognitive load. Because you live inside this incredible network of stimulation. And it's crazy, because all kinds of things are happening at the same time. There's huge uncertainty, because we've increased our velocity. And I don't want to talk about change being the thing that always, fuck that, like that's an old motivational bullshit talk. But the truth is the level of uncertainty, because we're moving at such pace, when things do fuck out, they fuck out real fast, okay? And you can look at that in the financial sector, you can look at it in the technological sector, the medical sector, because now we have this incredible network of travel. So a virus doesn't have to travel the way it used to. It can fucking go business class, right? Like it's <coughs> one airport and it's fucking everywhere, right? And then it has this brilliant new thing where it's gone like it's gone beyond. It's now using the, the digital networks to make us fight about who wants to get vaccinated. I mean, you understand that the virus is now in the internet. It's moving through the internet and using stupid people as hubs. It's brilliant, right? <laughs> Populism is a huge problem because we have a leadership vacuum, so no one's got anything to offer. There's just no substance. So instead of going, I'm gonna fix things, they go, fuck them! And we go, yeah, fuck them! So that's another uh, problem. And you've seen it with Trump, and you've seen it here, and I'll explain some of that just now with the graph. But then you have an incredible amount of data. There's just more information passing by a human being than ever before in the course of a day. And making that worse, you have AI targeting you all the time, preempting what you think, what, what it thinks you want to see. You want to see, and you've done this, or I've done this. Instagram, you get onto Reels and you fucked for like an hour, like you're just watching mindless bullshit the whole time. You lulled into a sense of security because it's the same eight songs. Like it's, you know, it's the same thing, and you realize you're watching water flow or like, you know, a monkey do something. Like it's fucked. So that's happening and several platforms. So you try and avoid one and you get stuck in another one. There are lots and lots of platforms. So, but this is not new. This is one of the original poisons that was uh, uh, described by the Buddhists. And there are three main poisons described by the Buddhists. I just want to talk about one. The, the three of them are hate, greed, and ignorance. But the one I want to talk about um, is moha. And, and, uh, and um, uh, it's, um, it's, so it, it's a distortion of reality. And, and this is where my studies have come in. Instead of trying to make everyone understand what I understand, what I've understood is that everybody has a slightly different understanding of reality. We all have a different, and it's all real for everyone. And that's why I was so chuffed to find out that the Buddhists had this shit taped long ago. It's not new. So look out for confusion, because almost all other poisons come from confusion. Almost everything you experience in a day that like fucks you over is often because there's a confusion. And in that confusion, there are two things that happen. One is that you delude yourself and that you distort reality. You become confused. So at the center of all of this is you and me. We're in the middle of a really crazy fucking thing. So stress is a real, distress is a reality. So the big push now for me is clarity. That's the thing I'm trying to understand. That's why I'm educating myself. That's why I'm no longer sharing you know, racial stereotypes. And I know I've done it tonight, but the terrible thing is it's a pattern because I hear you being quiet and I'm not used to that. So I need to make you laugh and I know where you are. <laughs> and I come to you, so don't feel bad, I'm with you. We've collaborated to reinforce, and I've done it. Racism, I've done misogyny tonight, <laughs> and I've done some violence, so it's going well. Um, so there are two things about a human being. We have about 6,200 thoughts a day each on average. Mm, Steve Hoffman, not so much. Now, now <laughs> he has like eight, and so, so there, there, are two parts to, there are two parts to how we uh, process information. The first one is, the thoughts we have, that's the content, okay? Um, but what we very seldom pay attention to is the structure, the container. We never really criticize our own container. We, we'll share thoughts, we'll throw them at each other. We'll do all kinds of stuff. But there's too many of them. And if you go back to the previous slide, it's accelerating. So why don't we focus on what's our container? 
And this is gonna get me to where we're going tonight. We're gonna talk about identity because that's our primary container of all of these thoughts. In fact, it shapes some of these, quite a lot of them. But it also has an impact on other people who have their own container. So that's quite important. So what I'm gonna use uh, to explain this is something which Americans feel they've got taped and they hate because it's being taught to their children. And that's wrong. Because Jesus Christ, we don't want American children to be taught things. That's such a bad idea. They'll grow up and they'll have no chance of becoming president. So, so, so I wanna show you quickly what critical race theory is because it's been deeply criticized in, in America and, and there are like, like protests about it being in classrooms. But essentially it began as a, in the legal fraternity in America and all they really said was, it doesn't matter if you have racists. That's like an individual thing. That's like your multibella, right? but you can test if you have racism. And that's why it's drawn like that, because no one really knows what the fuck it is. It's just this ugly little fucker, vaguely sort of genital, but it's a weird <laughs> thing. You see, that's what worries me, is I need a laugh, dick joke, bingo. You guys are so fucking reliable. Anyway, so, so, so racism, how do you test if there's racism in a system? It's really simple. You just look at all the social systems. You just check all the, because so, you can measure this shit. How many people get jobs? What do they get paid? What marks do people get? How far do they get towards university? Um, how many people get home loans? Or do they, are they successful with home loans? What level of home loan do they get? These are all metric things you can measure. We all understand what criminal justice is, right? Like you can tell who's incarcerated, who's not, how long are the, like there's numbers here. And what it spits out at the end by people who really understand numbers is black people have a tough time and white people don't, broadly. What that means is it doesn't matter if you're a racist because we know that's a sensitive topic. We know you don't wanna think you're a racist. Okay, but the system you exist in spits out data that will tell you that that's the truth. That's essentially critical race theory in a nutshell, okay? Is there anyone here who thinks that's a fucking stupid idea? Because to me, this is unemotional. It's just maths. You just spit it out, okay? So there are some ideas as to why it's bad, but, but mainly what's clever about um, racism on a systemic level is it, it makes you the state because you feel responsible. So you become a, a role player. It takes a system that was designed way before you and it makes you represent that system. So when the time comes, you feel attacked and by defending yourself, you defend the system. I know that's disturbing, but there you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> what happened? Because <laughs> you did something really delicate, and then it all went to shit. <laughs> and then you leaned over as if, maybe if I just touch the glass, it won't fall beyond the floor. Um, and you're like a big guy, too, which is so funny. Is it hard being delicate with muscles? Anyway, so, so, so these are the criticisms of, these are what the people who don't like uh, a critical race theory have said. Number one, it's a postmodern approach, which really means these fuckers are crazy. We don't know what they're saying. They're just mad and they're cynical and they didn't like us from the get go and they're just saying everything is fucked. It's not quite true. They're just using some lateral thought and making a couple of assumptions that are more human um, than institutional. So, so, so there's a lot of good things that the postmodern movement have done. A lot of it's deconstructive. So, so that's pretty good. Um, then there are some left leaning people who are fucking batshit. Like that happens. Okay? It's not just that everyone on the right wing is an asshole and everyone on the left is a good guy. That's a little too simple. There are some batshit crazy people. So every now and then, you just wanna fuck up a feminist. Like, not everyone, just the one lady who's got a hand grenade in the shopping center. Like, just fucking <laughs> calm the fuck down. We wanna talk. Just relax, okay? And I'm using feminist for a very specific reason. I know it needles people, but you need to understand that anyone who looks like you could be the problem, right? Like that's really important. I told you I was the problem when we started. So you don't forget that because I told you three dick jokes. Now, now so, so there, is a sort of a, there is a sort of a toxic left idea. Now, now <laughs> if you wanna listen to Jordan Peterson, <laughs> um, he'll tell you that the left has lost their mind, right? I think there's value on, on every side. And then finally race. So there are some scholars who've said, well, you can't really write about the effects of racism if you're a white guy. You know, like there, so there's some voices that might be silenced because you know, they, they're not from that group. So there are some issues, but they mostly say that these things put stress on institutions like economics and the legal system and all of those things that were around for a long time and children 
Uh, because, and, and, and to a degree, I, I believe that if you tell a young person that you're a toxic male from the time you're born, that could have an adverse effect. I mean, I, I do believe, because I don't believe in Christianity for that exact reason. I'm not prepared to be born like guilty. Like, fuck, dude, give me a chance to break something. <laughs> You know. In fact, I went out of my way <laughs> when I was born. I've done most of the Big Ten. Um, um, I'm trying to think what I haven't. I didn't, I didn't fuck my neighbor's wife. That's the only one. Um, I, I don't know that we're doing young people a service by exposing them to that level of rigor at a young age. I think I deserve it to a degree. I should be able to handle it. I'm not a big fan of white fragility. I don't think male fragility is a good idea either, but I think we've gotta be careful with young people. I, I do think that, that that's important. I'm not saying it happens every time, but there are some confused young men running around this earth, but they're also traumatized young women. So, so I mean, I don't think it's kind of a, a binary thing. So, so there's a bit of criticism, and I wanted to just say that because before I use this, as someone who's going the academic route, it's my duty to attack the thing I'm trying to explain before I actually tell you that it's, it's perfectly right. So, so I'm using this as a vehicle to try and propose something else. But these criticisms do exist, and they're by clever people. Not all of them are just stupid. Like Some of them are really kind of good to read. Um, so that brings me to this fucker. <laughs> Mr. Bobblehead. Um, I'm not a... I know, Gareth, we've had some conversations. I've always wondered whether underneath those conversations there's kind of rigor. Um, and now I'm almost prepared to make a decision. Um, so this is what he said on the radio to Ruzzulli, and I've, I've got it exact because I want to take it apart piece by piece. Um, I'm not interested in identity politics at all. Nobody really is. Uh, oh, please. <laughs> it's hard not to read this like a fucking baby, but I, I'm going to try. Oh, please. Um, um, I'm over it. Okay, here's a baby. Um, it's just uninteresting, and this has played out so badly for people in other parts of the world where they have tried. So I just want to point out that when you say you're uninterested, um, you're no longer in, you have no attitude of inquiry on this topic, so stop talking about it. If it doesn't interest you, shut the fuck up and go away. Don't carry on. If you're disinterested, walk away. Do us all a favor. But don't say you're uninterested and then carry on to attack everyone. It's a bit stupid. Um, nobody really is. Okay, you can't assume authority. On what does he base that idea? Nobody really is. Like, that's not a fucking, that's not a fact. That's just stupid. Like, you're just bullying people. And then finally he says, you know, and that's played out so badly for other people who've tried that anywhere in the world. That's a threat. Okay? So, so and this is a guy on the radio who's now going as like, no, I'm trying to, like, understand. No, you're not. You're basically being an asshole. So, so I just wanted to um, show you what, exactly what he said to Rodzilli and that day. Um, so, so there was an interesting bit of research done because he's saying nobody gives a fuck about identity politics. That's the basis of his argument, okay? The idea that who you are doesn't feature in what you say or what you think. Now I'm gonna show you some research. So we need to start with something we can measure because when you talk about qualitative things, like identity, it's, it's a difficult concept because there's no maths. There's no quantitative data on this. It's a feeling, it's a view, it's an experience. So you need to find something you can measure. So there's a thing called affective commitment. And in this research, it was figured out that you could, you could measure affective commitment in certain places. So an organization. Affective commitment means how committed you are emotionally to that organization. So you can find measurements. How long do you stay there? How keen are you to leave? What would induce you to leave? You can start to do turnover numbers, you can start to interview people, you can find out what they get paid, what they've been offered elsewhere. You can start to find a way to measure that. And then you read, why do we choose affective commitment? Well, there's lots of uh, writing that co connects affective commitment, number one, to trust as a component. Number two, perception. So you can see what happens. We start with some maths, and then we start to kind of radiate out into more abstract concepts, but they connect it by quite good research. And the third one is identity, and that's why I wanted to show you this. Because I want to try and explain to you tonight how fucking important your identity is. It doesn't mean I want you to protect it, but I don't know if we understand how powerful our identity is in the way that we interact with the world. So what this research found out was that lots of academics have connected affective commitment to perception. Lots have connected it to trust, and lots have connected it to um, identity. But no one has connected all three to affective commitment, and them to each other. I don't know who did this research, um, and the gaps that uh, appear. So you can, have, you can have identity and trust, but if you don't have perception, 
you've got a problem. Um, you see, if you, don't, if you have identity and trust, you, 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 you get on with each other, you know who you are, but you're not paying attention to the current situation, so you, have, you lack situational awareness. It's gonna be very hard to change. Move with the times. Nobody can change in that situation. If you have perception and identity, but you don't have trust, um, you'll have a lack of progress, because you never take risks. Ever, ever, ever. So you can start to see how these all work. If you know who you are, and you trust the other person, but you never allow identity, you'll never ever get diversity, it won't happen. So, I wonder who did this research? Oh, it was me, I did it for my thesis. Fuck, I just remembered. So, so no, 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 wait, 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 please don't. I haven't got the letter yet. Um, um, <laughs> this could all be bullshit. But the point is this, so, so what I wanted to show you is that this ties in to all of these things, and ultimately, it's a critical component. It's hugely fucking important. So when Gareth Cliff calmly says, nobody cares about this, I don't care what they care about. I'm telling you what's important. It definitely, it definitely is important. It's fundamental to how you see the world and, and how you develop trust. Like, fuck, what else is there in South Africa other than how we see reality, how we see each other, and how we feel about each other? It's all linked to our fucking identity. And we come out of a system that specifically assigned agency to specific identity. So if you were this identity, you got all the stuff. If you weren't that identity, you got fuck all. And not only that, you got undermined. So you, you've had too much, you've had not enough. Okay, just get together, we'll, fuck, we'll have a World Cup, we'll let one brown guy out of jail, and let's have a braai. Fuck, it's a castle commercial. <laughs> We're so way off. We're so way off. So what I wanna do is, I wanna use critical uh, race theory in another way. I wanna, I wanna play identity through the same model and see what happens. Because I think you could do that. So you have an individual, we know there's prejudice, and by the way, the Google button is just there to show you, because uh, Google measures this beautifully. It measures uh, 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 critical race theory as well. Uh, if you put in certain things in Google, uh, it will spit out racist and prejudicial um, options. And then we blame Google. Well, Google doesn't have a fucking brain. Google just does what we want before we, want, we, we ask for it. We put the info in. So Google is a very good measurement. It's a great measurement of how much uh, systemic prejudice or racism there is. And we'll just use prejudice because racism is a form. So we play it the same way, and we can look at, at all kinds of identity. We can look at like gender, we can look at race, we can look at uh, sexual orientation, we can look at all kinds of things, and it will spit out an answer. And the answer that it spits out every time is the white male fucking coins it, every time. Every time. <laughs> I love how this went from dick jokes and stuff. Jesus, I got you good. I mean, you were giggling at me killing a family of Lebanese ants, and now it's just horror. Okay, good. Um, so let's just talk about identity politics and how unimportant it is and how nobody cares about it because it doesn't matter, okay? From the beginning of time, you, you can just look at biology. Um, how agency has evolved, and if anyone doesn't know what agency is, it's really simple. It's just your independent capability to do whatever you want. Like, that's, that's basically what it is, right? Free choice. So, and, and power to do that, to act on your will. So if we look at, like, evolution, because that's what we are, we're an ape, right? I mean, you, you only have to watch reality TV for, like, an hour. <laughs> we're, a, we're a fucking ape. So, so don't ever call people monkeys, it's rude, they're apes. Um, um, we've watched agency be transferred through species. Like someone had control. And at some point, it got up to primates. And then there, there must have been a time where we coexisted as genders. There was a time historically when women actually had a more senior role. And if you're really honest about how things play out in the world, and you think about the balance of work, they still do. But at some point, bingo, we got all the power. And you'll notice a small brown guy here because once you get past this kind of behemoth of a white guy, the next one is all the other men. So that's the truth. And that's evolution. It had to find an agent. It had to find one place to put the power because that's how evolution works. I said at the beginning, it's not an intelligent process. It's brutal. So it dumps that. It, that just goes to whoever's got the best strategy. That's all it is. It's a mindless mechanical process. And so that's what happened. And we know, we know 
that there were women who were religious leaders, community leaders, they were heads of state. There was a time when that was the truth. But evolution's got this terrible kind of outcome. Once a species has dominance, then they turn on each other. Because remember, it's survival of the fittest. And fittest is a terrible word because it suggests some arsehole in fucking, you know, lycra pants in four ways, <laughs> fucking doing something healthy. It's not fittest. It's, it's survival of the biggest monster. So that's what that is. So, so this is how it happens. So Gareth, it's not who you know. <laughs> it's who you are. It's all about your identity. This is not a fucking, this is not some gay guy throwing a fit because like no one respects my kind of way of speaking. That's not identity politics. It's stitched into our fucking core. And we programmed, men are programmed to win at all costs. Especially white guys. That's why we outrage. That's why we'll fight at a bri over like talking about a stupid topic. That's why we go and watch a rugby match and we'll actually fuck someone up over a mythical battle that needn't have happened on a medium where nobody you're screaming at can hear you. And you're a useless fat fuck screaming advice to handpick athletes. No one cares about your opinion, Brian. <laughs> but that's how amped we are. That's how we'll burn down a stadium over a soccer match. That's how amped we are to win. A non-existent battle. Now think about how we've treated the other people on this planet. Not a soccer match anymore, it's fucking horror. <laughs> this is going so well. So, <laughs> I like this quote by Luandro Klaasor. She said, identity politics enables the marginalized to articulate their felt oppression through their own experiences. Life sharing allows us to recognize the commonality of our oppression and enables us to build a politics that will change our lives. That's the quality of South African we have in this country. She doesn't have a fucking radio show. We need this lady talking more. We need Gareth talking less. On primetime television, he told another woman who looked like this woman to shut up because no one cares about what you think. Shut the fuck up. We're talking about the elections, which are really important. Um, so, so when it comes to arguing about who's in charge, I've got this idea called Newtonian gain, and I just want to share it with you really quickly. Now, please, I'm not going to be that guy. I'm not going to chopra all over you because that would be rude. I'm not going to mention quantum physics at all because just like Deepak Chakra, I don't understand it either. I'm just gonna use some simple physics to explain what I mean by this idea and strategy of Newtonian gain. So there's a closed system, it's called the planet, and it, it's all the stuff. And when we were smaller creatures, we didn't know the edge of this thing. We didn't know how big it was. We just took fish out to sea, and we drilled the fuck out of the oil, and now we've found the edges. We now know that there's edges. We've drilled everything, we've fracked the fuck out of things, we've x-rayed everything, we, and we know what's at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, we know where every dolphin is, we can find the calamari without fucking even our eyes open, we are winning. So it's a closed system, it's measured. You know it's closed and you know it's finite, why? Because billionaires are now shooting dicks into space to find more stuff, because they've realized we are fucked if we don't find more shit. So, so it's, a, it's definitely a closed system. And somewhere in that system is something I like to call my stuff. Because I'm an ape programmed to win. So I need to get as much stuff as I can before I die, because then, nah, then I'm a winner. So are you. So you have your stuff in the same system. <laughs> and it's really funny, because it's a zero-sum game. Even if you give your stuff to your children, over time it will be redistributed. Because that's how power works. That's how uh, everything works. Because every system seeks equilibrium. And we are very lucky to be in a very equilibrium-driven system. That's why we exist. So if you're going to take something in a closed system, it has to come from somewhere. Someone has to lose. Now, we talk about value creation. It's a myth. It's not. It's just value reassignment. Think about anything. A good example, credit default swaps. That wasn't clever. That was a bunch of bankers going, fuck, we'd like some really big bonuses. Let's get them from poor people, <laughs> okay? And they did. Because you create a deficit somewhere else in the system. So you're not creating value. And business schools are trying very hard to reverse furiously at the moment. They taught people that the only reason a business should exist is to is shareholder value. Where does it come from? Where is it from? 
the banker bonuses rob the poor. Simple, there's no value creation. So now we have this thing. We don't like the idea of stealing from other people, so we make shit up. Well, I worked hard for what I have. Where did it come from, fucker? So now when you design a strategy in a closed system, if we wanna keep this rock rolling, we've gotta figure out if we're gonna win, so you get new targets, yay, 20%, okay. Who's gonna lose now? Who are we gonna fuck over? Because it's a closed system. And the reason I mention this is, it's so important going forward in identity politics. Everything you gain, where the fuck does it come from? You're taking it from someone. So every strategy going forward now should think about, okay, good, great strategy, what's the Newtonian gain? So I'll give you a practical example. Here's a graph showing you how the country was more or less made up politically in 2016. That's 2019, and this is 2021. So we all know the obvious. Obviously, the ANC is losing power, obviously. I mean, that makes sense, because they're, they're, they're a struggle organization. They were never meant to run a country. They were supposed to win a country, and they did that. Then they had to quickly learn how to run a country, and it's, it's a fuck up. Okay, it's a disaster. So they're falling apart and they're losing voters. And it's quite right that, you know, the noble struggle is now broken up into you guys are shit managers, we're getting the fuck out of here. Fine, I understand that. That's the obvious one. The DA is the DA. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a sitcom, right? There's this drunk lady on Twitter all the time just <laughs> yelling between Botox sections, you people are ridiculous, whatever. So, so yeah, they're not doing great. I mean, they, they're on the kind of, they're not, they're okay. I mean, they're fine. What's the real winner here? Does anyone know what the real winner is? Can anyone spot the fucking, like the outlier winner? Huh? Someone say something like properly. Other. Other. other, yes, other's one of them, but they're not numerically the strongest winner so far. Don't look at size, look at rate of growth. The Freedom Front Plus are fucking nailing it. Look where they started, they were 1%. In a fucking 2021 South Africa in democracy, they fucking, they've gone up 240%. So let me show you Newtonian gain. That almost all comes from the activity of the EFF. These are people without really a policy. They've got great rhetoric, they've got great fucking stories, they've got great like, charismatic leaders, no policy. That's why they keep changing. They're trying to find what the fuck they can do. Like they keep trying to do stuff, but they're scaring white people who are now going, oh, I don't know if Helen is enough. I'm sorry, kids, we may have to go car key on this one. <laughs> that is a Newtonian gain. The EFF fucking around is causing a spike in the right wing. You see, that's a closed system where you've got this many voters and you fuck around. You're gonna cause these problems. So when we start to solve the issue of our social policies and systems and how we treat each other, we've gotta think about that. As we make gains, what's the problem? So yes, men are toxic, okay, fine. What about the fucked up children? How do we solve that? You know, we've got this thing about toxic masculinity. Okay, we also have gender-based violence. Fuck, are they connected maybe? Maybe we need to think about that. Like maybe there's a fucking problem here. There's that group of idiots in America who now actively hate women who won't fuck them. Um, um, insults, right? Have you heard of these people? Like they think it's fine to hate people. It's fucked. So, so, the problem with this idea of being in a closed system is we've lied to each other, men particularly. We've lied to women. We've done a few scams, and I've just got two to show you. So, so this one is, we wanna enter a, like a social contract, right? And inside that social contract are all these protections. Uh, and the idea is that if you just comply, you can get that stuff. Well, we asked women to comply, and they did, and they didn't get the stuff. They're not as employed as us. They don't get the same protection. They don't get the same benefits, they don't get the same advantages. So people have complied and they've been lied to. There's no voice. See, the idea is that once you're in, you get voice. There's no voice, and I'll, I'll show you what I mean, because the, the numbers are pretty clear. Oh, and this is another one, I'll show you the numbers now. <laughs> There's an example I found in the medieval church, which I love, right, this is amazing. Yes, that's wallpaper of RT vaginas, and so, and so <laughs> I, love, I love it, I'm, I'm getting it in the lounge, and so, and so, <laughs> Um, so, so the medieval church did two things, the Christian church, and this is all, by the way, in two excellent um, um, books. Um, 
The first thing is that they separated a couple of things. There was never really a devil uh, until the medieval church. There was never a you know, cloven hoof, ugh, fucking hell. None of that's in the Bible. Um, there's a concept of, a, of, a, of an angel that fell, right? That, that's in there. But there was never a discussion of this kind of boshy in hell. Uh, it didn't exist, and they made it up. So, so what they did was they took two different characters, and they kind of spun them around a little bit. There was an idea of this conscientious objector in heaven, an angel who didn't feel it was right that there was absolute power, and so rebelled. Now, I don't have this religious belief, but I understand the philosophy of it. If you have absolute power, you need something to offset that. It's very important that there's a voice of reason. And that's why in the sort of satanic uh, sort of churches of America and other places, a lot of it's in this book by these very clever people from the Nordics, um, it's, it's a counterpoint to absolute authority. So there was always a trickster in every religion that comes from sort of a holy place. You find it in Norse mythology, Loki's a good example. There's always a trickster, and that's the jester, right? Like that's the little fucker with the funny nose who talks truth to power. Because anyone knows that if you're gonna have power, you need something to offset that. So they took that and they kind of mixed it with a few other demon-y things from other pagan ideas, and they spat out this devil. Now that was the first thing, they needed an enemy. And in fact, Satan means the adversary. It's a really important thing. Even in the Vatican today, when they have uh, a potential saint on the sort of table, they hire someone in who's not a Catholic to argue against the, um, you know, the making of a saint. It's called the devil's advocate. And I think they've abolished it now, but it was in, in place for a long time. So, so that's important. But, but what they then did was they said, well, 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 good things live in the mind. Like good, God is in the mind and the devil is in the body. They made that successful split. Now think about that. Women weren't allowed to learn. Only men could have a mind. So men were good. Women give birth, menstruate, do things we don't do with their body. Perfect devil's playground. Then we burned millions of women. Because even if a man fucked up, well, it wasn't his fault. A woman made him because the devil and then the woman and then vaginas and so... <laughs> brutal, ugly, horrible. So there are ways in which we've, we've done this. Men developed a strategy and we stole agency back. It's not new. It didn't happen like 10 years ago. This is a fucking old thing we're living through. So it's quite important. I really recommend you read those books. The Invention of Satanism is a brilliant academic study and the other one is called No Go the Boogeyman. It's brilliant. <clears throat> and then we have this thing called like male toxicity where we, we you know, we have Jordan Peterson telling us, yeah, but shame, men have got to do shit. Like they've got to provide and they feel pressure to like take risks to show like, Ugh. and like, you know, we can't discuss our feelings. And then we've also got penises, which is so pr problematic. We can't ask for help. Oh, yeah, but we get a lot of stuff to do those jobs. We get all the stuff. We still have GBV. So while that might be going on numerically, women are getting fucked up. You can't say, well, because this is going on, that's not really that. Come on, guys, it's just a few checks. Come on, fuck, what the fuck? They're both happening. Again, it's another strategy. We're trying to hide behind this, what aboutism, you know? So let me give you some facts. Women own about a third of the global wealth and are half the population. So that's fucked. Um, I'll come to this one at the end because that's my favorite. Um, less than a fifth of the Earth's land, but 400 million women do almost all the farming and produce food. This is interesting. Roughly $10.8 trillion of unpaid care work is performed by women globally every year. We can't, afford to, we can't afford to not have women do that. Our economy depends on, that's $11 trillion worth of free work that we, we benefit from. That's really important. And these clever people estimate that um, there are about $160 trillion in losses globally in the lifespan, the earning lifespan um, uh, because of the uh, inequality between the earning power of men and women. The economic value of this thing is fucking us as well. But this is the scariest thing. 41% of the women on earth live in countries where they have no choice uh, whether or not they can have an abortion. None. That's their body. So, so those decisions are made by men. That's your body, it's your, it's your shit. 41% of our planet. I think that's fucked. So if anyone's sitting here going, yeah, but like men have to like, I mean, there's pressure to like drive your car fast and 
like not speak about your feelings. It's a global fucking disease. So that's a problem. Um, so luckily we, we live in the Goldilocks zone, first of all, from a scientific point of view. Our planet's in the perfect spot. Right temperature, right gravity, right mix, everything. And that's pretty much how all of our systems work. All of our systems, and this is basic physics, everything will find equilibrium eventually. So, so the good news, women, is that we will probably see a correction soon. What we're living through, this ugly phase, this terrible, like, violence, stupid fucking psychology, psychologists playing arenas to disenfranchise men. Groups of young men who were unfuckable um, getting angry. I think those are the death throes of masculinity as a power. I think we are, like, we, we, we're putting up the last fight. It's a cycle. <laughs> you know, enjoy your turn, everyone, but it, it might swing back. But I think we're probably seeing the end of that power because of all the ugliness that's coming out now. It's really, it's really kind of pronounced, and the level of violence is ridiculous. So, and the other thing is, generally what happens is activists energize the system, and centrists will then drive sustained adoption. So there'll be a period of some kind of sanity. I think it started in New Zealand. It's kind of, it started there, and then, because, you know, they're like the first people to see the sun in the morning, so that makes sense. Sanity, oh! and then eventually Pretoria. So, so, <laughs> so, so there's some hope on a macro scale. Like, unfortunately, people are still gonna die and there'll be assaults and attacks and things will happen, but hopefully that, that will happen. So, so I think that's what's going on right now. Men cannot believe that they're at the edge of their power and so they're just putting up the last fucking, I mean, Trump is a perfect example of a pimple that just had to be squeezed, you know, like, it's a fucking ridiculous idea of this orange idiot, like, to boo. Shut the fuck up, please. There's no global warming. You are fucking orange already. It's too late for you. Um, and lots of them. We had a president who was famous for his cock, essentially. Um, uh, Jacob Zuma. Remember when all we knew about him was he was a dick. And then, then obviously, we wish that was the last thing that was, uh, we, he was famous for, because he used it to fuck the entire economy. But anyway. Um, so so, so what's, the, what's the solution? You know, because I'm giving you all this doom and gloom. Well, there's that one thing which maybe it'll swing. Uh, and then there's this, which is, if you look at countries that have managed to make social progress quicker than others, um, what they've managed to do is decentralize agency quite quickly and give it to everyone and then redesign social systems that include everyone. This is the next step. Like, that's, that's the really good thing. In the Nordics, you'll see this has already happened. In other countries, it's happened. All of these people are considered all of them. And then you spit out systems that are like, you know, not just, you know, horrifying. There's restorative justice. You know, there's consideration for all of these things. Um, you'll find them all over the world. But what they've done is they've decentralized agency. And in a macro, uh, on a micro level, as a man, this should be our new thing. We should decentralize agency in our relationships, in our family, in our work environment, in our friendships, um, we should decentralize power wherever possible. We should find those places where we feel concentrated power, reflect on that, and then try and give it away. When I say give it away, don't hand it to some fucking crackpot in the Woolworths, but think about how you can meaningfully decentralize agency in your own environment. That's what my research showed, is that if white leaders could decentralize agency to talented uh, people of color, there is this incredible reaction that starts to happen. And I'm not saying I came up with that. I got it from successful young black leaders who've managed to pull off that relationship with white leaders and also white leaders who saw it coming and started to do that already. You don't have to like get into a philosophical discussion. You don't have to win. Just practice it. Just start the practice. I met a man, a professor, who was a white guy, came back from England when apartheid ended, a senior medical professor. He was tasked with finding a way for a medical school to bring black medical students up to speed quickly off a thin base and pass them through the system because the government wanted black doctors as quickly as possible. And it's a difficult problem because you had a system that was designed to undermine people's education and psyche and identity and then put them in charge of other people's lives. So what he did was he quickly started to recruit young people who could teach not the curriculum 
but teach critical thinking, communication, writing skills, and um, all of those things in the home languages of the students that were in the school, instead of English. Outside the time, outside the curriculum. The curriculum wasn't the problem. It was the bright people. They got it like that. Like, doctor's not that hard, seriously. Don't be fooled, just because you have to wait 20 minutes to see them. They're just in the room watching YouTube like you are. Like, it's a, you know, like, a GP is not a genius, seriously. If you are a GP here, like, fuck you, dude, seriously. Like, you're not worth the money. You, you, you get it wrong. And so, and, so, and so they suddenly started to see a massive uptick in, uh, in, um, in pass rates and because people were being engaged from an identity perspective. Who are you? Where do you come from? And the other thing he showed me, when... Uh, interviewing a, star, a new staff member, if he had a black candidate and a white candidate, and they had the same qualifications, he used a principle called distance traveled. It's brilliant. How far did you walk to get to this point? And he always gave it to the person who walked further. It makes a better doctor. So the question is, when you get involved in these racial arguments, how far did you walk? How far did the other person have to walk to get to the same table? It's a really simple way to solve it in your head. So, so I'm a huge fan of this idea that we can use kind of identity politics, which Gareth Cliff said was a heap of shit, as a deeply fucking smart way of sorting some things out. So once you know who you are and you start to understand who someone else is, just identity politics, you become a lot smarter about yourself and them. And this has helped me a lot to solve complicated, I thought it was complicated, it's not that complicated, it's pretty simple. So we need a new social contract, and, and that's a, like a holy grail, everyone talks about that, but you could actually achieve it. And then gender, I just wish we'd stop talking about like, you know, gender, as a, like my gender is, and then there's an answer. You just have gender, that's it. Does that upset you? It does. <laughs> Do what I'm asking you and piss in the middle. Um, <laughs> Binary fucker. Um, <laughs> we don't have genders. We just have gender. Like, it's a quality that all humans have. It doesn't matter where you fit in. You just fit in. Like, you know, I just wish we could get this right. Like, I know I'm talking about identity politics, but where you pin yourself, like, forms such a binary thing. It's like, it, you know, you're a member of a gender. Why don't you just be fucking of gender? You know, that would help. But I suppose we have to sort this out because we've, we've established this binary kind of win-lose, so we need to restore things. But in the background, what's happening is gender's emerging. People who don't fit into that, we have to consider them as well. If we're gonna form a new social contract, we've gotta consider people who don't, don't wanna be gendered. They just wanna be of gender. So that's quite important. It's just a spectrum. And then Gareth went on, because that was just one thing he said. <laughs> It's just part one, folks. This guy's an idiot on several levels. Um, um, he then said to uh, Rizzoli, the, the, the Institute for Race Relations has published loads of reports of people who don't care about racism. He said this on television, and he's right. There are people who are trying to fucking feed themselves. They don't have time. They don't have the privilege of worrying about racism. But just because like, someone is at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy, and doesn't have time to worry about like, the effects of racism because they're trying to find out where dinner's gonna come from, that doesn't mean we have to stop. How bad is what he said? He's saying, because poor people don't have time to worry about it, fuck it, don't worry about it. No fuckers, because we are gonna get dinner tonight, we need to worry about it for them. That's our job as the privileged. We need to fucking make sure that a person who's looking for dinner doesn't have to have like, hunger and racism. So we've got to be careful. This is a 702 expert. This guy's believed by people. It's shocking. Here's another thing that emerged from this interview, which is really interesting when you defend someone. The way it was pitched by the people who attacked Gareth made it look, because they cut the video to the part where he was just rude to her and she was like stuck. It looked like John <laughs> Stiernhazen and Gareth Cliff and Rizzoli in the middle being bullied. Small brown lady, two big white monsters. But what happened later in the interview was never shown. She recovered, and she fucking had grace, and she had intelligence, and she kind of came back and schooled them both, actually. So what's interesting about that is the people who wanted to defend her purposefully made her look like a victim and disempowered her in order to set the stage for them to mount their attack. 
And that's bullshit. What they should have done was show the whole thing and say, it's still fucked. Even though she recovered, give her the power. Show us her being strong and then tell us it's wrong. Because that's the complex truth. Not some bullshit story that you cut up, which we'll find out about because we have access to media. So be careful how you support people. Don't make it up. Don't cause her like a weird binary fight. Be honest. It's really important. Because I wanted to punch a feminist over that. Don't disempower her. She was amazing. She took a moment. She had to roll with the punch. Then she fucking got up and she fixed it and she didn't hurt anyone. She insisted on her dignity. She said what she had to say. It was crisp, it was clear, and it was beautiful. That's what we need to see. Not that kind of like binary horror show. I'll handle that, don't worry. I'll fucking, I'll do a show and I'll talk about Gareth and it will be filmed on YouTube and Gareth will see it. Fuck you, Gareth. And so... <laughs> So we've got to stop that shit. We've got to stop it. It cannot be just allowed to be come up, flare up, and be a Twitter argument, and then that's it. And then this fucker, who I used to like, and I watched this program, and I, I just wanted to, there are two things I wanted to mention from like writing about this. He's, Dave Chappelle knows the truth. He knows the truth. It's not because he's clever. It's because just people need to trust him. We've lost faith in world leaders. So now we've made like comedians like these fucking oracles. That's why I don't want to do it anymore, because people think you're being serious. I've said I would punch a feminist several times tonight. Someone's gonna go, oh, maybe that's the answer. Let's punch feminists. Like, no, dude, I'm doing it for effect. It's art, fuck you. Um, um, <laughs> but we do trust Dave Chappelle. We cross over. We suddenly go from, oh, he's making like jokes and stuff to like, <whistles> maybe transgender people are fucked. That's a hugely dangerous idea. So Dave Chappelle knows this and he got about eight million or nine million dollars for those 40 minutes. Let's not forget about that. That's an enormous amount of money to earn for 40 minutes of spewing hatred. And then I just found a really good review of, um, of this particular show. And people are afraid to say this because Dave Chappelle is some kind of like above reproach. And this is the danger of celebrity and it's a danger of fame. You be, and that's why Bill Cosby could rape women for like decades. Not in my time, my mum's time who insisted my generation of fucking up the world. We're not so big on the like druggy, rapey, Cosby show comedians. So, so, I mean, you can read this. I don't have to read it to you, but it's a really good review. The guy's name is Stephen Kiss, and you should go and just read what he says. It's, just a, it's a very good review of what actually happened there because Dave Chappelle flipped the argument just quickly. I'm gonna show you now what he did, but, but go and read the review. It's a really good um, sort of thing because the problem with this fucker and all famous people is that we just see greatest of all time. That's the kind of designation that we go with. But Dave Chappelle's not just that. He's several things and so are you. So he's got like a racial identity, he's got a gender identity, he's got a, what I like to call a fame identity, Bill Cosby, a wealth identity, Bill Cosby, a merit identity, you know, suddenly I'm a philosopher because I have a microphone, what does that mean? And a power identity. All of those things are a portfolio within what's called a social construct. And he's got all of those things, and then, but we are really interested in, because he's the greatest of all time, whatever he says is brilliant. And he gets away with stuff. And he, he shouldn't get away with stuff, because we should be able to Jenga him. And what I mean by Jenga him is, we should be brave enough to go, Dave Chappelle, the more or less idea, I dig you, but don't like this block. Don't like that block, that's fucked. I don't like this one. And then, oh, look, it fell down. Oops, too many blocks. That's what we should be doing. But we don't, we just go, oh my God, it's Dave Chappelle, oh my God, oh my God. And it was interesting to me when I watched it, the person I watched it with had a little bit of that. It's like, well, because it's Dave Chappelle, I mean, I'm sure it's, I was horrified. But to be honest, I've never watched a, a piece of Dave Chappelle's comedy like that before, through that lens. Horrifying. If you strip away the power and all that stuff, and maybe it's because I've had a little bit of that, like I've had a little bit of that power and then I've kind of woken up a little bit in myself, and not by being like a hero at all, by doing a lot of the same stuff, horrific shit. Uh, I, there are things I still, they're like weeks I don't remember. I'm waiting for some terrible footage to come up with me somewhere in a drug den <laughs> with, there might have been animals, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> so I'm coming here as a reformed human being looking for some kind of redemption, I'm not, I'm not preaching against the thing, but, but this was a clear example to me that this has gone too far. So let me show you what I think he did. 
he says in the special, that like he's the guy who walks away from $50 million. And he did that, right? He had a deal on the table, $50 million, and he ran away, and he didn't take the deal. He's gone on to make over $100 million. So that doesn't really make you like a martyr or like a man of principle. What it does is it makes you a gambler. He took a calculated bet. Who's to say in his mind, he didn't go, you know what, if I say fuck you to this money, I'll get bigger money. That's not a reason to admire someone. He then tells a story about a transgender human being that he kind of latched onto, and then he allowed that transgender human being to open one or two of his shows. Now, I know from the industry that Dave Chappelle has a list, a pool of people that are allowed to open his shows. Uh, we have some South African comedians who are in that pool. So the idea of giving someone a show is not a big deal for Dave Chappelle. It's something he's always done. This particular human being was transgender, which gave them some kind of political currency. So now, because he's being attacked by the transgender community, he trades off that one particular open spot. It wasn't heroic act, it wasn't charity. It's something he did anyway. So, so what happened was that person then committed suicide. We don't know why, we don't know what their mental state was, but Dave Chappelle takes ownership of that suicide, puts it into his $8 million special, and says, this person then killed himself after I gave them an open spot. Clearly, we were like deeply connected because I let them stand here when I wasn't there. And then we find out that this person, because not enough that they jumped to their death, they've got a kid, a daughter. He then says in his $8 million special, I'm gonna open a trust fund for that kid. And I want to hand that child the money myself. That's the worst thing I've ever fucking heard in my life. Why tell us? And why do you need to hand the money, you fucking hero? Do an EFT. <laughs> Shocking, it's a showman. That's just showboating. He then says, as a black man, I really admire the gay community, who he's been completely rude about in all of his specials, totally homophobic. And the reason he says is because I'm a black guy and I've been kind of prejudiced against and you're gay guys and you've been prejudiced against, you guys are like me. That's called a straw man. It's complete bullshit, like it's a, it's a bait and switch. You can't compare them, why? I've just explained, identity. The identity of the gay people is not the same as the identity of Dave Chappelle. In fact, we all have individual identities. So to now start grouping people together and trading them as a currency to show that you somehow have empathy is bullshit. It's a false comparison. So that's nonsense. <clears throat> and then he says he'll talk to the transgender community, but there's a list of conditions, like it's a fucking kidnap ransom handover. He said, you have to do this, you have to do that. Oh, and you have to admit that Hannah Gadsby isn't funny. Imagine if I said that to you. Like, you can come watch the show, it's free, but you have to renounce Satan and all his works. You've got to kick your mom in the balls. And I want you here until like three o'clock tomorrow morning. Those are my conditions. You'd say, fuck you, that's a bit heavy. Why would you have to do that? If you want to have an open dialogue, why would you have one condition? Surely you want to bring your stuff and then they bring their stuff and that's the point. So what am I saying? I think Dave Chappelle's a complete see you next Tuesday. But I, again, I don't want to make it about one guy because that would be really pointless. We can all just point to Dave Chappelle and go, oh, he's such a dick. It's not about him, it's about us. That's why I gave up comedy. Where does the onus of critical thinking lie? Whose job is it to think critically? Is it the famous person with the money and the power and the fame who's lost touch with reality? Or is it you? I think you know what the answer is. One of the reasons I gave up comedy was you. Because I know what you want and I can give it to you really quickly. What you want is not good enough. It doesn't carry us forward. Come to a comedy show, we can talk about weaves, we can talk about how you know, chicks are dicks, we can do dick jokes, we can do fart jokes. It's not good enough. Because we're in a bit of a hole, and we need to fix that. Even Dave Chappelle, top of the game, $8 million, not fucking good enough. Because I'm Google. You ask me for it, I give it to you. And that's a huge problem. So on that upbeat note, <laughs> it feels weird, right? But there's good news, because you can change that. 
You could demand better comedy. You could read better news sources. You could stay the fuck away from Instagram. You could not watch reality. You could, you could read things that challenge your critical thinking. And then we're in Woolworths. Can you fucking imagine the conversations then? Actually, Kevin, there's an excellent study on kale. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not all doom and gloom, but the truth is, when I, like, I've stared at so many fucking people, and I've had to understand what they want to laugh at. It's not fucking good enough, and I do it too, man. I, I love watching Trailer Park Boys. Like, that's my favorite thing in the world. It's fucking childish. There are people who know what I'm talking about. It's really bad, because I'm, I'm an ape, but I'm also an ape who's decided if I'm going to do that, I need to plant some trees, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put myself through the fucking reading. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try a little harder. Just do something like this tonight, which is a complete fucking ambush. Everyone's sitting there going, fuck this guy. <laughs> I thought this was gonna be a fucking hilarious show. Like he said dick things in the beginning, but that was just like, he was teasing. <clears throat> so here's a tool, because I, I don't wanna leave you without like, you know, anything. So I use this, and it's called Ikigai, and it's, it's a simple system to find out what your essence is. That's how I find out what my real thing is. Comedy's not my thing. It's one of the things I can do. It's a language that I use. It's a way to reach people, and it's fun, and it's great. And if I can convert that to a better level of comedy, and you prepared to come with me, I'll fucking do a show again. No problem. Because as Mike said, I'll fucking change my mind. That's fine. But for now, I'm angry about like where we went together for decades. We weren't kind to gay people. We were not nice to fucking cast us a menu. Like, I did those things, right? And it was fucking terrible. So I did this system, and it's really just a bunch of questions. The outside questions are the important things, and you can look this up on the internet, and you can get YouTube videos on how to do it, but what, do you, what you love, what the world needs, what can you be paid for, and what are you good at? You just have to answer those questions, and what will come out of those at these intersections are, what is your passion, what is your mission, what's your vocation, and what's your profession? And in the middle is what the Japanese refer to as your purpose for being alive, ikigai. And it wasn't designed by the Japanese, just so you know, it came from Spain but they use the word and it's beautiful. So I'm just gonna show you mine because uh, I thought it'd be useful and a bit vulnerable and I will just give you that information. So this is what I, um, I love. I, I, I like the idea of systems for thinking and systems for feeling. That's really the essence of what I, I'm, I'm interested in. Um, I think the world needs better humanity. Um, I have some skills and they are articulation, the ability to synthesize and to empathize with people. That's kind of why I was able to get away with some comedy and be rude and still get away with it and get more rude and, and get away with it. And then what can I be paid for? So, so you know, tools, um, packaged products and systems. And basically, I'm going to build tools of understanding. That, that's what these talks are going to be. And, uh, and I'm doing some other work uh, in education to try and I teach uh, business people, which is amazing because they need it the most. And, uh, and that's it. And so, so you don't have to actually write this in, but, but my ikigai really is, is better humans being. That's, that's the phrase that I came to, is better humans being. And, and uh, because we need to be, we need to like practice, we need to be in the fucking world, uh, and uh, we need to be human. You know, we need to understand our weaknesses and be able to talk about our hypocrisy and be okay with that. Like I realize a lot of things I've said tonight are totally fucking double standard, but that's what I am. So are you. No one's fucking perfect. Mother Teresa, Jesus, look what it did to her face. All that self-righteousness, she looked fucking terrible, moisturized, bitch. And so, and so... <laughs> Stephen Hawking chose maths. <laughs> Fucked him up. Um, um, so, so, I'm just doing it again. Um, it's terrible, isn't it? Whenever we feel that heaviness descend, we just got to like be rude about someone and yay, fuck them. Uh, we're, we're animals. Um, but that's it. So, so if I leave with anything, uh, that's it. I just, it gives me great pleasure to just leave a screen that just uh, says you. And so, yeah, thank you very much, and uh, it's been good being here. Thank you.